As a prerequisite to deploying an SDDC, it is important to first understand a few of the basic architectural details of that SDDC. In this section, we will discuss the standard components of an SDDC, provide an overview of both the vCenter and vSAN configurations within the SDDC, and discuss the networking model used within VMware Cloud on AWS. The diagram below illustrates the components of an SDDC. As seen in the diagram, an SDDC consists of vCenter, vSAN, and NSX installed atop a collection of bare metal ESXi hosts. As part of this setup, there are a number of VMs which are considered to be infrastructure level components of the SDDC. These include the vCenter server appliance as well as the NSX management and edge appliances. If additional services such as HCX are added to the SDDC, then their virtual appliances would also be included in this group. Since VMware Cloud on AWS is a managed service, customers are given limited ability to alter infrastructure components. Instead of full admin rights, customers are given a cloud admin role within vCenter, which grants them the ability to create and manage their own VMs. Additionally, customers are given the ability to modify vSAN storage policies, as well as to configure certain aspects of NSX. Here, the illustration shows the resource pool and cluster configuration of a standard four-node SDDC. As seen in the diagram, there are two resource pools, one which houses the infrastructure VMs and another which contains the compute VMs which are owned by the customer. By default, vCenter is configured using a single cluster, which contains all hosts of the SDDC. This diagram provides some details around the vSAN data store layout of an SDDC. As we can see, a single vSAN cluster is configured across all nodes of an SDDC, and the cluster itself is configured to provide a pair of data stores. This logical separation at the data store level protects the infrastructure VMs from accidental changes by ensuring that customers only have permissions to the data store which they control. Looking at the vSAN configuration for an individual host, we can see that each host contributes eight NVMe flash devices to vSAN. Using this group of eight disks, vSAN is configured with a pair of disk groups, each containing four disks. Within each disk group, one disk is reserved for cache and the remaining are reserved for storage. This configuration yields roughly 10 terabytes of raw storage capacity per host within the SDDC. It is important to restate that this is 10 terabytes of raw storage per host. The overall raw storage increases by 10 terabytes for every host added to the SDDC. As noted, each host contributes roughly 10 terabytes of raw storage to the SDDC. Actual usable capacity, however, is a function of a couple of variables. Firstly, the vSAN storage policy applied to VMs affects the amount of overhead required for data storage. For instance, given the first policy in the table to the right, there is an overhead of 2x required to implement the policy. Given that RAID 1 mirroring is used, this means that for every byte of data stored, two bytes of data are required to implement. Another contributing factor is the type of data being stored and the ability of dedupe and compression to reduce the overall storage footprint. For instance, if you are largely deploying VMs which are all running an identical operating system, then the vSAN dedupe feature will likely be very effective. It is also important to keep in mind that vSAN is not like traditional storage where you may only define a single storage policy. With vSAN, you may create multiple policies and apply them in a granular manner. Finally, the VMC Sizer tool has been made available as a means of assisting customers with estimating the number of hosts required to meet their storage demands. Next, we'll review the networking model of an SDDC. The diagrams represent a typical network configuration with an on-premises network on top and an AWS region below. Within AWS are the SDDC and the customer-owned VPC. Let's start with the SDDC. Despite the fact that the hosts of the SDDC are bare metal hardware, the AWS infrastructure mostly treats them as if they were EC2 instances. This means that the hosts themselves are tied to an AWS account and that their networking stack is based upon the VPC technology used within AWS. As indicated in the diagram, each SDDC resides within a dedicated VPC which is owned by the master VMware AWS account. However, the SDDC itself is utilizing NSX as a means of abstracting its internal networks away from the underlying VPC. 
This is an important point since workloads within the SDDC are not exposed directly to the AWS infrastructure. This abstraction allows the SDDC to support traffic types such as broadcast and multicast, which are not normally permitted within AWS. Looking more closely at the SDDC, we see that from a network perspective, it is divided logically into two parts, a management network and a compute network. Each of these respective networks are bordered by an NSX edge gateway, which has its uplink interface attached to a public subnet within the VPC and its downlink interface attached to a series of NSX logical networks. These gateways serve as both the north-south edge router for their respective environments, as well as a stateful edge firewall. It is important to point out the purpose of the separate network environments. The management network is used by the infrastructure components of the SDDC, while the compute network is used by the customer's compute workloads. Following the standard permissions model of the service, the ability to configure the management network is somewhat restricted, while there is more flexibility when configuring the compute network. Next, we'll look at the customer VPC. The customer VPC is a standard VPC which contains at least one subnet which will be used for cross-linking to the SDDC. Since the SDDC does not reside within the customer-owned AWS account, a cross-link is needed in order to provide the SDDC with direct access to the customer VPC. Here we see that the cross-link is implemented by an ENI within a subnet of the customer VPC and that this ENI is tied to the CGW. Using this design, it becomes possible to route directly between the compute network of the SDDC and subnets of the VPC. Due to the placement of the SDDC within the same availability zone as the cross-linked subnet, cross-AZ bandwidth charges are avoided between the SDDC and the VPC. It is, however, important to note that if the SDDC communicates to subnets which are outside of its own AZ, then cross-AZ bandwidth charges would be applied per standard AWS policies. The routing for cross-linking is facilitated using static routes which are created on demand as logical networks are added to the SDDC. It is possible to view these static routes within the main routing table of the VPC, however modifying or deleting these routes should be avoided since doing so will impact communications to the SDDC. Next, we'll examine the customer on-prem network. In the majority of setups, Customers wish to maintain some sort of permanent means of secure connectivity to the SDDC from their on-premises network. Here, we'll examine the most common mechanism available, IPsec VPN. IPsec VPN is used as a means of providing secure connectivity to the SDDC and is implemented with separate tunnels to the MGW and CGW. Again, since there are two separate networks within the SDDC, it is required that two separate tunnels be created. If IPsec is not immediately available, then it is possible to permit direct connectivity to the public IP of the vCenter server by adjusting the security policy of the MGW. Doing so will allow direct HTTPS access to the vCenter web client over the public internet. Similarly, a jump host may be added behind the CGW, which can be allocated a public IP and granted direct access from the public internet. However, for a more permanent solution, IPsec is the recommended means of connectivity. Given the interconnectivity between the various network environments seen in the diagram, it is important to discuss the subject of IP address management. In order to ensure that all environments can communicate, it is vital that IP addressing be properly planned. IP ranges should be unique and not overlapping between the on-prem environment and the AWS environment, as well as between all SDDCs. It is specifically worth noting that the management network of the SDDC is defined at the time it is provisioned and that this network is fixed for the life of the SDDC. If this network needs to be changed, then the SDDC must be destroyed and redeployed. As such, it is important to properly plan IP addressing in order to avoid needlessly destroying SDDCs. Thank you for watching. For more information on this as well as other VMware Cloud services, please visit us at cloud.vmware.com. Thanks again.